The first. The first update is from uh, NSF, um, Geospace. Um, the, the program officers, uh, Dr. Alan Liu and Dr. Tai Huang. Um, so it's so a 30 minute. Yeah, Alan, you have the floor. And also um, for all the speakers, um, we got the feedback that uh, the audience in the back of the room um, had a hard time yesterday um, hear the, uh, the speakers clearly. So yeah, you can um, closer to the microphone. That'd be good. Okay, sure, is, is this good enough? All right, okay. Yeah, thank you. It's great to see a big crowd here. So I heard yesterday we have a record number of students and the participants. So it's really good to see. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm really glad to uh, give you an update uh, of what's happening at the NSF uh, in the past year. Uh, so uh, I'm a geospace section head and we have uh, uh, actually four of our uh, uh, people here join the CDAR meeting. Uh, so I will first like to introduce our uh, team here at NSF. Uh, we, so we are at the uh, Division of Atmospheric and uh, Geospace Sciences. And Anna Johansen is our new uh, division director. Uh, I'm the section head at the geospace section. And we have uh, six program directors. Uh, three of them are here. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Shika Rizada is our new agronomy program director. This is where Sida uh, resides. So Shika is here. Yeah, uh, yeah, you, you hope you will get to know her. Hey. Uh, tai Ying, so Tai Ying Huang, so uh, she currently actually is managed the agronomy program and that they too will gradually transition, you know, in the next few months. Okay, so you're welcome to, to contact them. And we also have uh, Roman Makarovich, so he's here uh, over there, yeah. Uh, so you probably all know geospace facilities is a very important part, uh, especially for agronomy. Many ground-based instruments are for agronomy research. Uh, so Roman manage many of these uh, large facilities, right? Uh, and we also have uh, other program directors that also sometimes, you know, we, we, you know, they actually work all very close to each other. Uh, Mangala Shama managed the space weather program. Lisa Winter managed the solar terrestrial program. And uh, Jia Ling Huang managed the magnetosphere uh, physics program. Uh, okay, so every uh, year, I, I first always like to acknowledge our prestigious uh, career awardees. Uh, this time, uh, so far, uh, in this fiscal year, we have these two awardees. Uh, there, there's no awardee this year in agronomy, but in the past uh, few years, we actually have uh, uh, more awardee in agronomy than actually the other two programs. So uh, first of all, this uh, we have uh, awarded to uh, to Mag program. This is uh, uh, Jim Schroeder uh, from Wheaton College, and the other is a uh, Sokaina uh, Borahimi. Uh, that's a solar program from Utah State University. So congratulations to them. Uh, and I want to note that uh, this upcoming deadline is July 26 this year. So your earlier career, uh, you know, assistant professors, please consider apply this. Okay, we like to see more uh, agronomy proposals. Okay. And we also, you know, welcome proposal on space weather, even though the three programs, agronomy, mag, and the solar are core programs, but you can also use space weather as, as your, you know, central research topic, but you, you still want to uh, submit it to one of the three core programs. Uh, okay, so uh, some quick update on the facilities. Uh, these are the facilities, uh, not all the facilities that uh, we, we are supporting. This is just part of them. These are uh, uh, facilities that related to agronomy. Uh, you, of course, recognize the, the big ISR radars, and we also have the sub Geophysical Observatory. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, some facility which really is providing data to the community, uh, like the Ampere SuperMag. Uh, and we have SuperDAR network continue increase. 
Uh, so uh, Simon Schaefer recently just uh, installed uh, a new uh, Superdome radars at Iceland. Uh, and we have CCMC that uh, I think uh, there was a report uh, on Sunday. Uh, so these are all uh, infrastructure service to the community. So uh, 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 I hope that uh, they will be you know, useful for the entire uh, uh, community. Uh, so recently we have uh, some award given to uh, Millstone Hill to do uh, uh, some uh, um, uh, much needed repair work. To keep the uh, the infrastructure, you know, up to its uh, uh, status, uh, and uh, uh, the the Ampere, uh, we have a new award a couple of years ago, and they finally have uh, produced a new uh, better data since last year, uh, and uh, uh, Superdon I just updated, uh, so uh, magnetos uh, magnetometer network we are also uh, making new awards. To continue some of the its operations, uh, so other other than that, other facility are running, uh, you know, generally okay. The riser N, you you saw the email from SD. You know there was a fire, but uh, we already have plan in place. You know Roman did a lot of work with SD, and uh, so in the fall we expect it to back to to at least the, the uh, operation. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, so one major thing I want to highlight in our uh, geospace section is the new solicitation called the Faculty uh, Development in Geospace Sciences, so FDSS. Some of you may be familiar. We have this solicitation several years back, a few times. Uh, so we recognize this is a very uh, uh, important uh, way to increase the support in in geospace science uh, in universities. So this is uh, a uh, solicitation that is uh, kind of a before the career award. So we make award to universities that are committed to develop space science program as their curriculum. So the awardees will start recruiting a faculty member into the tenure track position after receiving this uh, award. And then the awardee will, will take over this grant and then this will be one up to one half million for five years for the awardee to develop uh, his or her research program and uh, you know maybe cover startup funding, graduate student, et cetera. Okay, so this, uh, uh, the, the target date is September and uh, we plan to, uh, different from the past is that this will be a standing solicitation it means it's not a one-time thing. So we'll accept this every other year, okay? And we expect to make two to four awards every every time, okay? So if you're interested, you know, talk to us. We already have two virtual office hours about this. Mangala is the main contact. Uh, and there, there are, yeah, you can look more detail online, okay? Uh, okay, so I always also want to highlight this uh, postdoc research fellowship, we have many uh, graduate students here. Uh, so we continue to have this AGS postdoc research fellowship. Uh, and uh, recently we uh, increased a little bit the, the award amount to 100K first year, 102K second year. Uh, this is very different from regular grant is that the awardee yourself, postdoc, have total control of the, the finance. You choose what research you want to, to go, you choose what institution you want to go, okay? So that's a very different experience. Okay, uh, okay. so I also want to highlight something that's that's uh, maybe different from the past is that, uh, um, you know, we like to support the students to develop their careers and uh, not necessarily always in the academy. You know, you, 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 you get all your trainings, get your degrees, uh, you know, academic certainly is a is a great uh, place to be, but uh, people have different interests, uh, and the industry also have many opportunities. So we're actually supporting uh, students. You know, during your graduate years, you can go on some uh, internship activity that that is not uh, academic. Okay, and we can provide supplemental funding for that if your advisor you know have a current NSF award. Okay. Uh, and we also partner with other uh, agencies. For example, this one is uh, uh, with AFIRL uh, to to create internship at uh, you know their research labs. Uh, and uh, the third one is a uh, is a um, opportunity to get funding to link our geoscience research 
into uh, human health. So, so link that to you know societal uh, impact, uh, you know, on the human health topic. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, another important thing is this. Uh, this in uh, in um, this uh, we call the geo embrace. Uh, Dear college letter that we call for proposals that coming from uh, you know minority serving institutions from underrepresented groups uh, to uh, you know to submit uh, research proposals. Okay, we'll give them uh, special consideration. Uh, this is uh, again is uh, our you know NSF mission to uh, to increase the diversity uh, of the you know the research funding, right? And there is a website uh, specific about this. Uh, okay, so this is a, a dear college letter that's specifically for the upcoming solar eclipses, and uh, you know we have two that across uh, North America. Uh, so they are already we are re already receiving lots of requests, the supplemental requests or, or uh, standalone proposals requesting funding for this. So uh, we we continue we'll consider that. Of course, the eclipse is coming up soon. Uh, but uh, we, what we look for is not just research, is also, but also lots of outreach activities to use the eclipse, you know, to do outreach activities to highlight the importance of the sun, you know, with the the, the solar activity coming up. Okay, uh, so please uh, think about that. And uh, on that picture is actually an award we just made um, that will use NCAR's uh, spacecraft uh, uh, aircraft uh, to observe the the eclipse. Okay, so I want to highlight that because I think the community, perhaps not many of you consider the NCAR part as, as you know, the geospace, but really their facility is to serve the entire AGS. So they have the aircraft that can be put to use if you have good ideas. Okay, uh, okay. so these two awards, I, I think maybe not everyone of, of you know that we do have the mechanism to support some you know, some activity that needs to be done that have that is time sensitive. So that's called the rapid award. And the other actually is more important, I think is this eager type of award is that if you have some risky ideas, but can be potentially transformative, you can talk to us. And once you get approval, you can submit that proposal. These two type of proposal doesn't need external review. So the turnaround can be very quick. Okay. Uh, all right, so uh, finally, on the, the instrument side uh, opportunities, I want to highlight the major research instrumentation uh, program that uh, I think uh, probably many of you are familiar with. There has been a recent change uh, from the CHIPS Act that uh, the traditional cost sharing requirement is removed for at least five years. Uh, uh, so last uh, January, there was, you know, normally the, the MRI was, uh, the deadline was in January or early February. So there was one that received uh, early this year, but uh, now the date is changed to, to the fall. Okay, so it'll be October, November, that's the window. Uh, you can submit MRI uh, proposals uh, up to 4 million. Okay, but if you are considering larger infrastructures, there are mid-scale ones, uh, there are two mid-scales that uh, goes up to 100 million. And these two kind of are usually alternating uh, one year from the other, okay. Uh, okay, so this is our interagency activity. Uh, we work with NASA, NOAA, and also Air Force, you know, to, to find a way to coordinate, uh, to address lots of uh, uh, issues uh, with uh, the National uh, Space Weather Enterprise. Uh, so yesterday there was a space weather session, you know, there we, we realized there are many uh, issues that we need to coordinate. So we just recently signed this uh, called the quad agency agreement uh, to set up the, the formal uh, uh, collaboration mechanism. Okay. And uh, so that, that's a, also a new development. Right? Uh, and uh, I also want to thank the uh, all the members you know, in this community that contribute to the Decado survey. I know there are lots of work. There are five panels here, and you can see three of the panels corresponding to our three core programs. And then we also have space weather and the state of profession panel. So thank you all who participated in the Decado survey, and we look forward to your recommendations. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so this is uh, my final slides. Uh, I want to also, you know, remind you that uh, when you get an SF award, please uh, uh, include acknowledgement in all your uh, papers, oral presentations. Okay, so this is required when you you get the award. It's on the PEPG, right? Uh, okay, so I think that's all from me. So next, I'll have Paying give more detailed update on the Aronomy program. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, so um, I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, the, uh, talk about some of the awards that we made in the Aronomy program and also some uh, funny opportunities that's new this year. And also uh, I'm going to talk about uh, data infrastructure community workshop proposal that we're interested in receiving. And also lastly, I wanna talk about the NSF Public Access Plan 2.0, which a lot of people are concerned about. Um, let me see, how do I, do I do this? Okay, all right, so, um, NSF, so uh, NSF, uh, you know, around the program, we support research in the, uh, you know, through the uh, um, the core program and also target program, CEDA. And in addition to that, we also support some, uh, you know, uh, conference proposals. For example, this one, we've been supporting the CEDA uh, workshop for, I don't know, since 19, I don't know, uh, 1986. So it's been a long time. I hope that you are enjoying this meeting so far. And this year we have, you know, we waive the uh, uh, student uh, registration fee, so uh, to release the uh, the burden on the advisors, and um, so that is that. And thank you so much for the uh, thank you so much to the uh, the CPAS and the steering committee for organizing the uh, you know the uh, the CEDA workshop for many years. And uh, so I'm going to call up the uh, this uh, workshop that we supported. Uh, this was in Scranton, the Ham uh, Hamside 2023. Uh, uh, so that one, uh, you know, involves the uh, citizen science, which is one of the priorities that, uh, you know, at NSF, uh, we like to involve the, uh, you know, the amateur, the, uh, the, uh, the citizens to, uh, you know, to, to, for them to have the opportunity to uh, with the, uh, work with the uh, scientists, uh, you know, in, uh, to address science questions. So uh, these are the I was there, so it was great uh, to see, uh, you know, so many people uh, from the community and also from the uh, from outside the, uh, the scientific community to uh, you know to to have the uh, opportunities to work together and share ideas. All right, and the other things that I want to uh, talk about is that last year we made uh, two MRI awards through the Aronomy program. And one is the development of frequency agile multi-static radio system for geospace uh, imaging. And the other one is the acquisition of apiparoid interferometer to measure upper atmospheric winds and temperatures for helium, hydroxyl, and uh, atomic oxygen nigla and aurora emissions. So these two projects were selected for funding, uh, you know, uh, one major concern, uh, one major issue, um, not issue and concern, but uh, you know, uh, so one factor is that because uh, they they have the uh, the strong science, uh, you know, uh, you know, research uh, in the proposal, and the other thing is that um, you know we see the potential that it will have a, a you know broader impact and also the uh, potential uh, to benefit the community beyond the uh, proposing teams. I think that is the thing that you should uh, you know keep in mind when you uh, propose something. It's not just but uh, you know you should propose something that does not benefit your proposing team, but it's beyond the proposing teams. And uh, and also we've been hearing from the community about you know is there a mechanism to support the uh, the small instrument operation? We heard you. So this year uh, this year we actually have a pilot project that you know we encourage uh, you know uh, the PIs to submit proposals through the uh, the CEDA com uh, to uh, CEDA uh, solicitation. Uh, if they can demonstrate, uh, you know, some of the, uh, you know, components that uh, that was listed, and also, so I'll go, I'm going to talk about that uh, in the uh, in the next slide. And also, uh, you know, we also, you know, been hearing from the community about we need a better uh, data infrastructure. So we all start receiving uh, data infrastructure workshop proposals. So regarding the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, continuation of small instrument operations, a lot of people they were concerned about, you know, they have the, they receive funding, they, they have the, uh, you know, the instrument running, they collect, they've been collecting data, but then at the, at the end of the award cycle, what's going to happen to, to those instruments? And we do recognize that, you know, it is available to have the continuous collections of data. So, uh, so that's why, you know, in the, uh, this year we, we, you know, we sent out email to the community, uh, asking to submit proposals uh, through the CEDA, uh, see the program uh, solicitation um 
So uh, you know, in order for the uh, uh, you know, in order to get funded, you know, you you have to the PR has to demonstrate that there's a broad impact, and it is going to be the award will be made through a competitive uh, you know a proposal review process. And so, uh, you know, in, so when you frame the, uh, the proposals, you know, there are several components we're looking at. For example, you have to demonstrate there's a proven uh, scientific values to the community. And also, uh, you know, the, uh, the cost to maintain the, uh, the program, the uh, you know, operation and management costs should be at the minimum. And also you should provide, uh, you know, uh, training opportunities for students and also early co career scientists. You also, uh, we also like to see that you make data readily available to the community and uh, with no embargo period. And uh, you, should hold, uh, you should keep a comprehensive documentation for easy user access and be responsive uh, to the uh, community's needs. So, uh, you know, so uh, I know that CETA solicitation just had the, uh, you know, just passed its deadline. So we are actually opening up the opportunity. If you still have uh, great ideas, you know, we'll continue to uh, receive proposals through the, uh, the CEDA core program. So that is that. Now, uh, we, like I mentioned, you know, we heard, uh, you know, the, from the community that we need a better uh, data infrastructure to support, uh, you know, the community needs. So we, uh, so we, uh, we are going to re uh, actually, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we put the word out that we, you know, we would like to see uh, receive workshop proposals on data infrastructure, and that will, uh, you know, provide a space for the community to come together to discuss needs, best practices, and resources needed to address the uh, data infrastructure needs. So usually for this uh, this kind of uh, proposals, the uh, uh, the funding is limited to fifty k. Now, if you uh, if you have a really great ideas and you think that you know you have to uh, you know the the request the amount uh, you know probably you know have to above that uh, you know limit, uh, come talk to us. You know we should be able to to do something. Uh, yeah. And also, uh, you know, when you prepare the uh, the conference proposals, you know, uh, NSF had the PAP G. Uh, you should look up the appropriate session to prepare your, uh, you know, uh, your proposals. So when you, uh, you know, write your proposal, you know, the workshop proposal, they are, you, uh, in your proposal, you should identify critical needs for innovation in data infrastructure because it's, we don't want to status quo. We want to provide this opportunity for the community to come together to discuss if there are better ways to to do the to you know, to do science, to enable new science. And also, uh, you know, this workshop can be for a broad community or for a specific community with a common theme. For example, uh, maybe the Fabi Perot, uh, you know, sub-community would like to come together to discuss uh, the standardizations of data, the metadata uh, format and things like that. Or there's a LIDAR, uh, you know, community or the images. So just, you know, this is just throwing out the ideas, just to give you some ideas about, you know, uh, if, when you uh, want to propose, uh, uh, you know, the workshop, the workshop proposal, what kind of things that you can think about. Uh, and of course, you know, we definitely encourage you to come talk to me uh, so that we can, uh, you know, we can, uh, you know, like uh, brainstorm me, you know, what kind of thing, what kind of things that would be, that would be good for the community. So, um, so, uh, so one of the things that, you know, we, uh, one of the outcomes from the workshop is that we want a report that summarizes the conclusions arrived by, uh, you know, arrived at by the uh, conference participants uh, and address the identified gap. And there should be a plan uh, to, uh, for creation and dissemination of re written report that should be submitted to NSF uh, no later than three months after the completions of the workshop, because we want you uh, to actually put uh, you know, things together, the, uh, the report uh, uh, three months, you know, if, it's, uh, if you have a, a long lag uh, time, then sometimes, you know, people just forget about the important things. So in your proposal, you should address the, uh, you know, make sure that you have the community buy-in, there should be, uh, you know, enough uh, engagement for the community. And the Format of the conference can either be in person, virtual, or hybrid, and there should be the in-depth, uh, you know, interactions, and of course, the written report that I mentioned for public access. Um, uh, that report should uh, contain the gap analysis and also the uh, recommendations. All right, so. Now on to the open access, you know, why this is important because uh, last year, so this is just, this slide just give you some uh, background information uh, because, uh, you know, we know that you have the data, when you write a proposal, you have to provide the data management plan. And that is because, uh, you know, in 2013 OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, they actually had a memo uh, that uh, directed the agency to develop a public access plans and that uh, the research results has to be made publicly uh, available, including peer review public Applications and digital data. And uh, in the current policy, uh, it does allow for a one-year embargo. 
and the policy is right there. And then also PI can uh, submit their publications uh, through the NSF PAR, public access uh, repository, uh, you know, during the annual reporting period. So, in, uh, you know, we, we do want to emphasize that, you know, you don't have to publish with the open access journals. Uh, all we want, or, or you know, what you need to do, uh, not what you need to do, but the author accepting manuscript and version of the records will satisfy NSF, uh, you know, uh, requirements. All right. And then uh, now, uh, why we are uh, why this important about the data management and what we are now going to uh, uh, you know rename it as a data management and sharing plan because uh, you know last year OSCB they have a, a new memo coming out uh, directing the agencies to update public access plans and that call uh, that memo calls for free, immediate, and applicable public access, and the default is zero embargo or peer review articles and underlying uh, you know, data. So uh, you know, NSF has uh, you know, formed a working group uh, working on the public access 2.0, uh, you know, and then it has been submitted to OSCP and got the feedback. And I think the, uh, the finalized version uh, that's uh, approved by the NSF uh, internally uh, you know, is, uh, can be, is actually now available uh, on the uh, public access plan uh, you know, website. So we definitely encourage you to take a look. So right now, NSF is working on uh, you know, how to implement the, uh, you know, implement the, the, the public access plan. So there are several critical implementation decision, decisions are still uh, on the development because we know that it's uh, it involves a lot of things and we don't definitely don't want unintended consequences because of the uh, the policy. You know, once it's been uh, you know out. So uh, just so you know, the equity concerns is a primary driver in the NSF policy and implementation. And in fact, we had the um, the webinar like I think just a week ago or two. Uh, so uh, you know, all this if you're not able to uh, you know participate, uh, I encourage you to uh, go to the public access website, NSF public uh, access uh, website to take a you know to take a look to get a, a better understanding of what's coming and what's changing. So this one is the uh, uh, give you the timeline. So you all know what's required uh, during this current policy in January 2025. Uh, so the blue text uh, shows the uh, the uh, in addition to what uh, what you are already uh, used to. So uh, you know uh, in addition to the public access publication, now the the uh, refereed uh, conference proceedings will also needs to be uh, uploaded to the NSFR. And also the uh, the data undergirding the, uh, the uh, you know that uh, should also be uh, made public uh, accessible. So the data uh, can be the depositional data yeah, can be uh, you know can be updated to the external can be deposited into the external repository. And you have to have a reporting uh, DOI uh, in the the NSF PAR by the PI. And in January 2027, uh, there will be you know all this. Uh, you have to uh, include the uh, the persistent identifiers. And also include the uh, additional identifier information. And uh, plans for these changes are due to uh, OSTP in 2026 for implementation in 2027. So this will give you several years to uh, prepare yourself uh, that how you can uh, you know uh, make your uh, research output uh, you know public accessible to the uh, to the public. All right. So. NSF has been, uh, you know, uh, providing, uh, you know, uh, pro providing some funding opportunities to facilitate open science. So uh, the, uh, we have the research coordination network and also the uh, the pathways to enable open science ecosystem. There's also a, a call, the DCL, that encourages the, uh, uh, you know, all communities to use AI and machine learning to, uh, to uh, you know, to do research in geosciences. And also our uh, geospace section, you know, now we welcome the community uh, workshop proposal on data infrastructure and open science and data. Now, Lastly, uh, I want to talk about the uh, interagency helio physics uh, data working group that we, uh, we just uh, recently uh, we formed earlier this year. So this working group involves the uh, members from uh, several uh, you know agency like NSF, NASA, NOAA, and uh, and NR, uh, NRL. So uh, so the primary goal for this uh, working group is that we want to uh, you know leverage the resources and and to uh, you know provide a, a mechanism that can help support the. Uh, uh, the community in their data uh, infrastructure needs. So we are uh, we are planning a listening session. It's a two hours virtual sessions, and uh, uh, you know several some of you already received a you know invitation to uh, to 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 present. Uh, so the format will be about like five to ten uh, minutes presentation for each invited speakers. So uh, that was during the first part of the session, and 
and it will be uh, followed by the open uh, open floor discussion in the second uh, part of the session. So it's two hours. Now, presenters are invited to just the, the, the following questions, which you can uh, read from the slides. So if you're interested in this event as a speaker or as a participant, uh, you can uh, just send me an email so I can uh, you know, send the information uh, to you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu and Dr. Huang for a uh, very detailed update. Any questions? We can take a few quick questions. And uh, uh, before you ask questions, this is uh, Caitlin Greer from LASP. Um, when you talk about equity in these uh, contexts, what does equity mean to NSF? Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's a good question because equity, you know, uh, so when you talk about equity, because uh, we know that a lot of people, when they have research funding, they have no, uh, they have the, uh, they budget the, uh, the publication fee in their proposal. So they have no, uh, you know, they have funding to do that. But, well, uh, you know, when you, when we talk about, uh, you know, a lot of people, they, uh, they kind of like, us, like very, they have received very small funding. So publication uh, fee can be uh, a burden to them. So we want to make sure that uh, the equity, you know, it is equitable and uh, and so that um, people they can still uh, have open access uh, you know publication without a huge burden on them or their university to pay for the publication fees but again i think there's a misconception here because a lot of people are thinking that um actually i read when i read uh, when i read the proposal a lot of people actually put a lot of money on publication fee but as i you know my person just uh, presentation just show uh, you know, to you know, to satisfy NSF requirements, we only uh, ask the uh, the PIs to provide the uh, uh, the uh, the manuscript, uh, you know, accepted version. So in other words, you do not have to publish with the open access uh, journals because I know that open access uh, journal they charge a lot of money, right? You don't have to do that. I mean, at least you know on the NSF side, as long as you provide the uh, author accepted, uh, you know, uh, manuscript or or the AOA, uh, you know, that would satisfy NSF requirements. So, which means that you can you can put more money on your research, you know, the science research instead of paying money to the publisher to publish your uh, you know research results. Yeah, but uh, equity is a uh, is a is a huge uh, issue that we've been. So that's why you know we are uh, we proceed cautiously because we definitely don't want to have uh, unintended consequences because of the uh, implement implementations of the new policy. And also, you know, if you have any concern, you know, definitely send me an email because we are collecting information. So, uh, you know, we are in the process of, uh, you know, implement, uh, making the part, uh, you know, working on the policy. So we definitely need the input from the community to know, uh, you know, what are the, the, the biggest issues and what are the, you know, challenges. So that when we made the, uh, when we made the, uh, when we made the, uh, uh, you know, policy change, uh, you know, that those, uh, you know, concerns will be addressed or avoided. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we have to move on. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. John McCormack from NASA uh, about the NASA agency uh, update. Uh, can the screen be uh, switched? Thank you. Um, so John, uh, the laser pointer and time and uh, you can pass the slide. Okay, great, thank you. How's that? Sorry. Uh, as I said, this is the third time I've had the opportunity to give this presentation. Um, first time was uh, virtual, so it's always great to see everybody in person. Uh, some of you I've met, some of you I haven't, some of you I've just bugged for progress reports, so uh, via email. But um, uh, this is a, a great opportunity to uh, interact with this community. Uh, as you know, we've had some changes in leadership within our division and within the Science Mission Directorate. And to talk a little bit about that and to give uh, sort of a, an update on some of the division activities, I'd like to introduce Nicole Rail, who is the Associate Director for Flight Programs in Heliophysics. So. Thank you. 
Thank you, Liz. All right. Uh, I guess with this. Okay, great. Good morning. Thank you very much, John, and thank you for giving us an opportunity to speak today. This is my first time attending this conference, and I would like to pass along the regrets that Peg Luce, the acting um, director, could not attend, but I was really excited to come in her place since I haven't been able to be here before. As John mentioned, we've had a number of transitions and, and many are very exciting. Nikki Fox, who is the leader of the Heliophysics Division um, for a number of years has moved on to be the Associate Administrator for Science at NASA. She's totally rocking it in the new role and we're so thrilled to have someone that has such insight and depth of knowledge in the heliophysics arena at the helm of science for the agency. She transitioned in the February timeframe, and we have an open solicitation out for the next um, heliophysics division director that is closing this week, the 30th, in a few days. Um, but big congratulations to Nikki, and, and I hope we'll get an opportunity to interact with some of um, the rest of us that are here this week. We have a number of folks from headquarters, and um, and we hope to get to talk with you. So as John said, I'm Nikki Rail. I'm the Associate Director for Flight. My portfolio is the leadership of all of our flight missions and operating missions. Um, Peg Luce is our Acting Deputy Division Direct, Acting Director of the Division. Her normal role is the Deputy Director and she'll be moving back into that um, once a new director is selected. Also like to introduce who many of you probably know, Teresa Moreto Jorgensen, who is on detail as the Acting Deputy Director from NASA Ames. We're really excited to have her on the team in this interim of this transition period. So a few new faces as well. While we're not showing the whole team here today, we have a number of program scientists that have joined us recently from either IPAs, um, from some other agencies, and, um, and also a few program executives. But Janine Fisher, Kelly Korick, Janet Kazira, and Reiner Friedel have joined our team as program scientists. Elizabeth Esther has recently joined our team as a program executive. We also have on the street right now a current um, opening for program scientists that is closing tomorrow, I think, close of business tomorrow, Wednesday. So if you or any colleagues you know are interested in spending some time with us at NASA headquarters, please check it out. It's on USA Jobs, and we do really have a great team. Don't take my word for it. Talk with some of these folks here, but it is, is a really good team of people. So I wanted to mention a few things about our portfolio. Um, we have what we call the Heliophysics System Observatory. That's a robust fleet of spacecraft. Uh, good morning, and thank you to everyone at CEDAR here for allowing me to say a few words on behalf of ONR. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, again, I'm Bruce Fritz. Uh, by day, I'm actually a research scientist at the Naval Research Lab in DC. Uh, I do mostly UV instrumentation work. Um, but about a year ago, I got approached by ONR for uh, uh, an opportunity, we'll call it. <laughs> um, to work with the, the team over there. Uh, so for a little bit of context, ONR had a dedicated space weather program that in about 2010 was zeroed out of the budget. Uh, priorities changed, budgets changed. Um, the, you know, the, the remaining few folks that were still working on projects with them were rolled up under the meteorology group. And, um, and so that, that kind of went away. I think Bob McCoy is here, uh, was the, the last full-time person who was doing that. Uh, but in 2010, um, or shortly after that, Dan Eliterio, who is the meteorologist in charge of the meteorology program, uh, took on the, the space weather uh, interest for the Navy. And you know you wouldn't know it from talking to him, but he's mostly learned ionospheric science um, through on-the-job training, um, and he's sharp as a tack, so he's great at that. Um, so he's been able to grow that program internally, uh, you know, for quite a few years, just doing, you know, um, short-term projects where he was able to get internal funding awards to, to sponsor some folks. Uh, and then as, as recently as 2020, he's able to, uh, to get a, a dedicated space weather core line reestablished under the meteorology program. So we do have very small, you know, we're talking on the order of a million dollars spread across multiple folks, but we do have a core line. So we do have uh, you know, Navy interest, Navy needs, uh, and now Navy funding to support space weather research. Uh, along the way, he has brought on uh, Josh Kossuth, who is a NRL researcher, another meteorologist, and Kate Mulraney, another operational meteorologist who's brought on. So if you sense a theme here, they're all meteorologists. They didn't have training or background or you know, the, the established connection with the ionospheric community. So that's where they reached out to NRL to find somebody who had the background, the training, but also just was part of the community here, so here I am. Just really quickly, 
uh, as part of the Navy, you know, we do have uh, a, a lot of funding in a lot of different areas, uh, but it's not all operational stuff. You know, if you heard, you know, Sarah McDonald talking about the NEMO model yesterday in the O R session, you know, we do have an operational need and that's, you know, that's the big picture down the line. Um, but, you know, really there's a, a, a big chunk, you know, almost half of our funding goes to basic and early applied research. Uh, I think this slide's a couple of years old, but the basic idea remains the same, that we do put a lot of money into just basic research and fundamental science. And so that's why we're here today to talk a little bit about some of the opportunities we have. So what matters to, to ONR? Uh, our, our, our big topic of interest is ionosphere. Um, the bottom side of ionosphere especially affects it uh, that impact HF communications and you know um, radar propagation, communications propagation. So we're looking at things like you know sporadic E, uh, spread F, rural clutter, uh, TADs, and, and the like. Um, and I won't read this list to you because I've only got a few minutes here, and I want to get to the important stuff, the money. Uh, <laughs> um, so you can read this and, and get a sense at least. We 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 kind of uh, paint a, a broad brush, everything from modeling efforts to data analysis to to even a little bit of uh, low cost hardware. Uh, as I mentioned, these are a couple of the initial projects that Dan got funded through ONR. These were internally competed projects that he got a small pot of money for a short amount of time, you know, three years. Um, and so a couple of these projects here, I list, you know, the basic idea of what was done. And then, you know, some of the PIs, you can see some of the folks in the room who have actually worked with us in, you know, in the recent, uh, recent past. Uh, in particular, I want to point out uh, bottom side ionosphere, BSIN, that's really where some of the initial work for, for Nemo came together, uh, and that was successfully you know, spun into future work that has, has really rapidly grown uh, in recent years. So I mentioned there is a core space weather line. Uh, I, I list some of the PIs here as well, so you can kind of get a, a sense for, for who does work with us currently. Uh, and like I said, that, that spans a, a wide range of topics and, and inter interests. So if there's names on this slide that you're, um, you're curious what they're doing, I encourage you to go talk to them if they're here. Uh, I do want to point out NEMO again. Um, so that is our operational model. Uh, it's developed through NRL. Again, I'll, I'll mention Sarah McDonald is, is the one that kind of heads up that group there. Uh, but there's a, a, a great team that she she's brought together to, to work on that. Um, you know, the, the, the BSI and project is what really ramped that up, but then is really accelerated through uh, a separate uh, separate program with with DARPA, uh, but now you know ONR has kind of taken responsibility for for some of the maintenance and, and you know continued improvement of that of that model. So that's uh, really something we're really proud of with with ONR and the impact it's having on um, on the community. Uh, and lastly, the uh, High Fios project. I don't list PIs there because I didn't have the full list in front of me, and I didn't want to leave anybody out, so I just left everybody out. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's really just a low latitude implementation of NEMO. Um, you know, NEMO was initially developed really to improve skill at the mid latitude. So the first, or the, you know, the next step was to go to low latitudes. Um, and right now they're they're wrapping that project up. They're they're working on a field campaign uh, in Palau that I think right now everyone's battling logistics of how to get instruments out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. But uh, that's that's currently in works. Uh, and I will also point out that that on the top right there, that is the the uh, STPH five mission where uh, ONR did sponsor a few instruments. There was the the light spectrograph that Andy Stefan was the PI for, and then there's a, a GPS radio occultation instrument that Scott Budzine is still still collecting data with. So future work, uh, Prism. So this is my first baby pet project since I, I came on was to start a, a three year project looking at a high latitude regional implementation of Nemo. Uh, I've got a slide on it next, so I'll I'll defer that for a second. What I really want to get to uh, are the opportunities for the community. And I've only got a few minutes here. Um, one of the things we're looking at next is uh, a project to look at the impact of gravity waves on the ionosphere. Uh, and I will say that we put in a proposal for a six-one or a really, you know, basic research um, funding internally. You know, we got accepted but not funded. You know, so for anyone who's ever gotten a proposal with the feedback says you were fundable, but we're not going to fund you. Well, we get that too. <laughs> um, but please, we're still going to be working on that and are really hopeful that we will get the funding for it. So send me your planning letters, your white papers. And again, that's a QR code for our, our website where there's instructions for how to do that. Otherwise, please come talk to me. Uh, I'll be here all week. Uh, I would love to hear your ideas for, for what you'd like to do. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll really quickly talk about PRISM. 
Um, so again, there's the PI list. Uh, Angeline Burrell has actually been uh, been helping us as the kind of the lead for for the Nemo team in this particular effort. But there's a obviously a, a great list of folks here, uh, many of whom are here this week, um, some who couldn't make it. Uh, so really, what we're doing is again painting a pretty broad brush. Uh, everything from some data simulation improvements to uh, modeling improvements to just new data sources, um, as much as we can get our, our hands on to, to really try and improve uh, the NEMO model. And the, uh, the, 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 the capstone to that is hopefully going to be a field campaign in the winter of 25-26. So we're looking for, for something new and novel that we can do to really uh, try and, and grow the, the knowledge in the high latitude region and how that can support our, our um, operational model. So if there's, you know, sounding rocket ideas out there or something that's going to be, you know, a, a once off kind of um, opportunity, we'd, lo we'd love to hear from you. And so I will get a couple minutes here. So I want to at least talk about the funding opportunities we have, we have available. So the long range BA, that's our general uh, application process. That's the top QR code there. Um, that's how you apply to our core line and generally through the other uh, avenues we have available for funding. Uh, I, I, we, we encourage um, planning letters or for proposals by July 1st, which is coming very soon, um, which I know is tight. Um, but if that's, if that's tough, obviously come talk to me. The, the DURP process, that's uh, for research instrumentation. Obviously, we missed that for this year, but that is uh, a standing and typically annual um, opportunity. We do have SBIR opportunities. So there's uh, four that are active right now. Um, two that just got awarded, or well, are in the process of getting awarded for lightweight mirrors and solar blind sensors. Uh, there is uh, the high frequency maritime antenna and the F region day side neutral wind measurement. That's actually Clarissa Englert has been the POC for that. So he's developing, you know, along his family of, of um, neutral wind sensors. For early career and students, we do have a young investigator program. Uh, and so I will call out John Sabota, who I think is, I saw here. <laughs> uh, we're really excited to have him uh, working uh, with us here at, at ONR. Um, so if you have any uh, you know, questions about his experience, please um, go talk to him. Otherwise, please come talk to me as well. Uh, there's a couple of specific student opportunities. There's inter internship programs. There's the postdoc program that we fund uh, through, uh, NRC actually administrates that, but we, uh, we, we fund that as well. That's an opportunity to work at NRL as a postdoc. Uh, and lastly, I will end with the intern program that Alan talked about earlier. Uh, a little more detail about you know the, the the funding and the duration for what's available there. Currently, AFRL has uh, an active you know dear colleague letter there that that outlines the opportunity. ONR is very interested, and we're working on something very similar. Um, so I will say you know keep your eyes out in the next few months for more details about what that opportunity might be. Uh, but in general, it will likely be work with folks at NRL for the same kind of uh, opportunity. So I'm out of time but I will happily take any questions now, or again, at the breaks, I'll be here all week. So thank you. Uh, any questions for Dr. Chris?
Our next uh, uh, speaker is um, Dr. Bob McCoy and uh, Olga Vokolatova um, about the NASA Living with Star um, Analysis Group, um, a call for input into the NASA focused science um, topics. This is okay, but uh, this one, uh, how do I, can I just do this? Okay. Uh, so hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to present a uh, little information from NASA Living with a Star Program Analysis Group, LTAG. So we're calling for your input into the NASA focus science topics. Um, the LPAC program serves as a community-based inter interdisciplinary forum. We solicit a coordinate community input for living with the star objectives. And uh, this uh, group also examines the implication of this input for architecture planning activity, prioritization, and future exploration in LWS program. Uh, this is a website for LPAG. You can also find this by Googling NASA LPAG. This is a current list of LPAG executive committee members and uh, NASA LWS program uh, ex officio that support our work. In uh, this year, executive committee of LPAG is beginning to develop the next round of uh, input for LDBS focus science topics for ROSES 2024 and beyond. Uh, LDBS program provides, as you know, essential funding opportunity for heliophysics, uh, focusing on system science and is driven by community interests and needs for potential research topics ranging in a very broad area from solar physics to planetary habitability. And it's very important for us to have your input. And uh, success of LDBS science programs depends on community activity and our engagement in developing focus science topics. We're asking you to provide inputs uh, by July 21st this year. And uh, the suggested inputs, and we'll show you some examples, need to be organized around the strategic science areas. They can also be found on the same web page, just uh, Google NASA LPAG, and it has a wealth of documents. A new um, FSTs will be used for ROSES LDBS calls starting from 2024 and on. Uh, these are several strategic science areas. Um, that uh, are outlined. The, the you see they cover solar dynamo irradiance, um, transient phenomena in heliosphere, uh, transport of energetic particles, GICs, dynamics of global ionosphere and plasma sphere, and also ionospheric irregularities, composition of neutral upper atmospheres, radiation in space, solar impacts on climate, and uh, habitability. Would you like? We're trying to make this a joint presentation. So, uh, so some of the previous selected uh, focus science uh, topics in 2022, or you can see them there. There's a lot of words in these slides. I won't. I won't read everything. And in 2021, you can get get an idea of what's what has been what has been selected in the past. There are several candidates in the queue. 22, in fact. I won't read all these either, but just these are draft focus science topics, write-ups that came out in 2020, 2020. Uh, there's 11, there's 11 more. And in this, in this report, you can actually find all, all these things. And uh, in our last slide is uh, some of the, some of the uh, websites to go to. As Olga said, these are due by July 21st. This is, this is your chance to really get input into, uh, into what NASA does and the future for the Roses program. If you go to if you go to these links, it'll pull up a page. You can you can you can type in what strategic science area you're you're addressing. You can put in your idea, and you, you can answer a few questions. There's three links here. I, I guess this presentation will be available to people, so you can get these these uh, uh, these these links. But you can see what's been done in the past. You can see how to enter a new focus science topic, and you can see what the overall strategic science areas are. And with that, I'll hand this back to Olga to answer any questions, any questions you might have. 
Thank you. Okay, uh, please find us, uh, find us as members of a steering committee of LPAG if you have any questions, and we do encourage you to uh, provide your input. Thanks. Thank you. So here's our uh, final last um, update, the Keto survey, which uh, everyone um, cares about. Can you hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> move, move this, uh, this bar. Can you all hear us? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And are you going to advance the slides? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I guess the next speaker is online, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, the, the update about the uh, decadal survey, heliophysics decadal survey. Um, uh, so will you be able to advance the slides for us since you're sharing? Oh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Um, all right, so you can go to the next slide. Maybe put it in slideshow mode. This is a PDF, right? I put a PowerPoint there. Okay. Okay, that's good. Uh, so thanks everybody for um, letting giving us a chance to give the update. Um, just going to be a, a quick status report, uh, but we'll start with just a quick overview of some new things that this decadal survey is addressing compared with the last one. Um, so next slide. Uh, so in case you've missed our previous updates, I just wanted to mention and encourage everybody to go look at the statement of task, which is on the National Academy's website for the survey. Um, and what you'll notice is the statement of task for this decadal survey is quite a bit broader than the last decadal survey, um, namely it explicitly includes space weather, um, also addressing the state of the profession, and then also looking at emerging opportunities such as, you know, how to use studies of our system to uh, understand you know, other astrophysical systems and vice versa. Um, so the organization of the, of the um, committee and panels was, was developed in response to the statement of tasks to make sure we can address all of these items, um, in particular these new items. So next slide. So here's the uh, organization. So there's a steering committee, and then we have five panels. So three of the research, uh, basic research panels are, are somewhat similar to the last decadal survey, um, roughly paralleling gem, seed, or shine, if you will. Um, but then we also have a panel on space weather science and applications, and a panel on the state of the profession. Oh, next slide. Uh, this is the steering committee. Um, this is from the website. Um, one thing you'll notice is that there's been a change. Um, uh, unfortunately for us, Tomoko uh, had to step down uh, earlier this month. Um, so first, I just want to say that the steering committee and, and Stephen and I both are extremely grateful for uh, all the work that Tomoko um, did to contribute already. Um, but I know it was a difficult decision for her to step down. So uh, if you see her, please thank her for her service. Um, so uh, obviously we can't replace her, but we are working right now on a plan to make sure the expertise that she brought is covered. Um, so stay tuned for that. That's all we can really say at the moment. Um, but again, please just, uh, I'd like to thank Tomoko for her service. 
Uh, next slide. So in addition to the uh, steering committee and the panels, um, similar to the last decadal survey, we also have some cross-cutting working groups. And um, these are uh, composed of primarily people already on the steering committee or the panels. So we have steering committee um, members on each working group and then also uh, at least one member from each of the panels. Um, and these are meant to address some of the cross-cutting issues, um, programmatic issues, um, things like theory and modeling, uh, data exploitation, um, integrating ground and space-based observations, uh, access to space, and then also communications, infrastructure, and, and innovation, new technologies. Um, so these working groups each have their own kind of task statement. And we've actually just started, uh, these working groups really just started their work. The ground and space working group is um, having a meeting uh, in a, two weeks um, and they're furthest along. So we're, we're planning to be spending a lot of time on this um, over the summer. Um, and uh, that was on purpose because the panels were extremely busy, um, you know, earlier in the in the process over the last six months or so. Um, so so those are getting kicked off. So next slide. Let's see, is Stephen, are you actually there? I see him on. Yep, you are. Okay, so I'll kick it over to you now for the schedule. Yeah, uh -huh. I am here. I, I uh, was just waiting to turn on my video. Um, so uh, so this is the uh, uh, update of where we are in uh, in the process. Uh, as uh, as uh, Robin said, uh, we have all the panels finalized. They're uh, diligently working on their reports. Uh, there were 450 white papers received that span multiple panels. And uh, the white papers are available and will be published. And you can see from the schedule here that the, the panels are doing the bulk of their work right now. They're busy writing, and we are waiting the results of the uh, technical risk and cost evaluation or trace process for the missions that we put uh, that that the steering committee uh, in in the panels have given us suggestions. The steering committee has put forth uh, missions to the trace process, and uh, we should get those at the end of July, actually, uh, the results uh, of that. And uh, and that will figure into the panel reports. And then uh, and then the steering committee takes over with uh, with a large amount of writing to do uh, the the report is peer reviewed uh, early next year and published in the summer, basically spring, summer of, of, of 2024. And that's next slide, please. So uh, uh, the panels uh, and that we have, uh, they, they uh, as we said, they gave, they gave us suggestions for missions uh, and, and uh, they are also working on uh, listing the ground-based uh, projects that they would like to see go forward. Uh, so they were asked to identify a research strategy, so science first here, uh, uh, goals and emerging opportunities, and uh, these elements to also include uh, NASA missions and ground-based projects. So to develop the research strategy, uh, they were given a, a large number of community white papers or community input papers um, as starting points. Uh, only a limited number of missions can go through the trace process, uh, and uh, they were ultimately selected by the steering committee. But we did leave uh, how the panel evaluates the missions and ground-based projects up to that panel, particular panel. And they've, they've chose uh, different means. Some panels have requested information from the authors of a select number of white papers. Other men panels have chosen to hear from uh, all the white paper authors uh, for missions. And, uh, and we just want to point out that a request for information does not necessarily imply that a particular space mission is going to trace process. Uh, the next slide. And uh, we wanted to have a slide on uh, GDC uh, because, uh, well, uh, you know, it, it has important implications for the community here. But also, uh, we want uh, we want the community to the larger community to understand uh, how 
the decadal process works and how we uh, we are to respond to and how our role in this GDC pause. So the uh, so the decadal survey committee steering committee has a statement of task and guidance uh, agreed upon by NASA, and you can go and read this uh, guidance on your own uh, and the, in the statement of task. And uh, despite all of these issues with GDC and uh, all of what you see in the press, uh, this guidance is unchanged. And it says to describe the highest priority science goals. And uh, it requests that the survey not reprioritize GDC or, or dynamic, but is requested to reaffirm the continued priority of science goals. And we are diligently working uh, to our guidance. Uh, the previous decadal survey obviously put forth uh, GDC and dynamic as high priority missions uh, in, the, in their decadal survey. And the midterm assessment in 2020, which uh, uh, both Robin and I were on, uh, uh, and a GDC independent review board, uh, uh, IRB, uh, affirmed the priority science of GDC. And per the statement of task, the highest priority goals will account for these documents. Uh, so we receive input from the community uh, and the survey panels and from the survey panels, but we must do the deliberation and build uh, build the uh, survey report in private. And so what that means is that uh, to protect the integrity of the process, uh, decadal advice is not vetted or buffeted by considerations other than the community consensus about scientific priorities. And, uh, and so uh, we don't issue uh, public statements uh, in a, for con describing our deliberations or, uh, uh, or in response to um, decisions like the GDC pause. Uh, uh, it's important though to realize that the decadal survey won't be made public until the summer of 2024. And this report can impact uh, the FY 2026 presidential budget proposal and later budgets. So the earliest that the decadal survey has impact is uh, uh, in terms of uh, the budgetary process is the FY 2026 presidential budget. The bottom line is we're continuing uh, uh, to, to do our tasks under the auspices of the National Academies and agreed upon by NASA and other, uh, we, we don't leave out, we have several, um, uh, several agencies that, uh, that have uh, funded the decadal survey and uh, we're continuing under our statement of tasks. And the next slide, I think it's just a summary. Um, you can read it, uh, we're hard at work, the panels are hard at work. The steering committees met four times. Uh, we actually just met uh, mid-June uh, by vir virtually. And uh, we're confident we're gonna produce this report in the summer of 2024. And there'll be additional opportunities to follow the process and contribute. Um, and uh, they're listed here and we're doing, we're doing these town halls uh, and we'll be doing another presentation in December of this year at AGU, uh, uh, again, describing the process. We should be pretty close to having a report, a, a draft report, at least at that time. Any questions? Uh, any questions about the Kato survey? Um, Okay, we have a special program um, not on the agenda. Um, one of our dear colleagues uh, passed away, so I let uh, Larissa and uh, Dolores take it over. Yes, go. Uh, yeah, so who uh, 
I will kindly ask you to stay for uh, just a few more minutes. Uh, it's um, one of the uh, one of the things that we do in the community. We not not just celebrate our achievements, but also uh, remember our uh, cherished dear colleagues. Uh, we will. Um, so we have an announcement to make that uh, our dear colleague Adil de la Jabardia, uh, uh, passed away just several days ago. And um, uh, Anthea Costa and Dolores prepared a short tribute. So we will um, just let's, uh, uh, so let, let, let's, uh, let's remember uh, Adil uh, just for a few minutes. So we, uh, as you see, this is all uh, really unexpected. So we uh, did not, uh, did 